fact, the, the contemporary accounts of the speech and the reaction to it, tepid might be too strong. It is notable that in the immediate response in the British media, the strongest praise was not about what he said, but about how he said it. There was particular praise for his use of the teleprompter, and in the words of one British newspaper, President Reagan's smooth, word-perfect delivery, a delivery, and how members of parliament surrounded him to see how he managed his rhetorical feat. It certainly didn't say much for the initial response to the speech that the strongest response referred to the technology that he had used to deliver it and not to what he had had to say. And yet today, it is universally remembered as one of his most important speeches. Uh, the conservative commentator Charles Krauthammer said on the 25th anniversary of the presentation of the speech, that at the lowest point of the Cold War, a point when none of us imagined that the, this rock of the Soviet Union and the communism would actually be destroyed, what was so stunning was, about it was its optimism. Always the brightest commentator among the press, and perhaps I think the best biographer of Reagan among several very distinguished biographers, Lou Cannon, who spoke here with his son, Lou Cannon said that the Westminster speech stands the test of time as the most far-sighted and encompassing of Reagan's anti-communist messages. A judgment supported by John Patrick Diggins in his highly praised biography of Reagan who said it is one of the president's two most famous addresses. And so we have a kind of rhetorical mystery. How could a speech that created so few ripples at the time, in fact, in addition to the tepid response, there was hostile response that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. How could a speech that produced so few ripples now be remembered as one of his most important speeches? In a way, we're, this is like a mystery in which you've seen the crime and you've seen the ultimate resolution. And like that kind of mystery, I'm going to tell you how it happened. And I'm going to tell it how it happened by beginning with the situation in which Reagan spoke. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the drafting process, and Bill is exactly right about President Reagan. The stereotype about him as a mere actor is laughably false. And then I'm going to tell you about the speech, the response, and I'm going to talk about the ripples that have continued to come from that moment in the Royal Hall. When President Ray, when, when he was then former Governor Reagan running for president, the single biggest problem he had was the perception that he would, was dangerous with nuclear weapons. In one Gallup poll, it found that 15% more people thought that Reagan was a risk of creating a war than did thought that of Jimmy Carter. And President Reagan, in some of his early rhetoric, made people very, very afraid. In a very early press conference, the new president accused the Soviets of being willing to commit any crime to lie, to cheat, in order to accomplish their objectives. And despite that that was factually true, still it was viewed as quite dangerous. And so, in the immediate period, in Re Reagan faced very, very severe problems as the White House began planning for the trip. If people were afraid in the United States, and I'll give you a little bit more data about that in a moment, the problem was still greater in Europe where he was going to go, first to a G7 summit, then to Rome, then to Britain, and finally to, uh, finally to Germany. Writing in Business Week, Saul Sanders noted that the authorities in Germany worried about vast outpourings of youth and radicals who accused the US of seeking world domination. There were similar fears in Great Britain. Let me read to you, and there were also many doubts about President Reagan's cognitive ability. Let me read to you what the, the comments of a commentator who had praised Reagan's sense of mission and resilience. This is Roy Hatterley. This is the commentator who praised Reagan. He said Reagan was a man of naive ideas and simple opinions, which he holds with the certainty of a Midwestern preacher. He characterized his views as two-dimensional views of life and stated that small print and philosophical arguments have never been his style. That's an ally. Richard Pipes, a Harvard professor, major expert on the Soviets, on loan to the National Security Council, 
he summarized it brilliantly in, in very, very few words. The English elite regarded Reagan as a dangerous simpleton. Now, the situation wasn't much better at home. Reagan, after his first year in office, according to Gallup, he had the lowest job rating of any president at a comparable period since Gallup started doing measurement. As the spring went on into 1982, the situation worsened, and, uh, and uh, Reagan's approval rating fell to the low 40s. It got so bad that in April of 1982, 52% of the American people were opposed to Reagan running for a second term, and the New York Times quoted a, a senior advisor to President Reagan as saying, there's no question the guy's in deep trouble. One of the reasons that he was in deep trouble was the perception, as Michael Barone noted in the Washington Post, that a great many Americans and Europeans believe that Reagan is significantly more likely than his predecessors to get us into a nuclear war. And by the way, this is just one more example of why the conventional wisdom on Reagan has almost always been wrong. While that was the conventional wisdom, I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a few minutes, we now know that Reagan was a nuclear abolitionist. He wanted to get rid of all nuclear weapons and that he was the most conservative person always in the room in terms of using force. He was the least dangerous person in terms of getting us into an unnecessary war. We know that now, but we did not know that then. In response to this situation, and to give you an idea how difficult a situation Reagan faced, Reagan, according to some, of some people, James Reston said that he had toned down the martial music. In other words, he toned down his Soviet rhetoric. This led conservatives to accuse Reagan, and this is perhaps the harshest thing a conservative can say about a fellow Republican. One conservative commentator accused him of almost carterizing American foreign policy. Not cauterizing, carterizing. Cauterizing would be painful, but for Republican, carterizing much, much worse. It was in this situation that the drafting of the address began. The head of the White House, a speech writing office, Aram Boxian did the first draft, a draft that everyone agrees was bureaucratic in its nature. I suppose he might not agree. It was, by all accounts, not a very good draft, uh, and uh, although a little bit of it made into the final speech. It was at this point that Anthony Tony Dolan did a draft of the speech. To, and and there is, you have to need to know that there is a distinction in the White House speech writing office and in the White House between very true believers, not, who did not call themselves Reaganites, but often called themselves Reaganots, and Tony Dolan would be perhaps one of the leaders of this. These are very hardline true believers and pragmatists. In fact, there is an anecdote where one of the true believers, one of the Reaganots, talks about how they had to confront their biggest enemies in the White and that they had to fight in the White House. And he said those were um, the the pragmatists, the uh, so and so, and the Soviets. And then he said, "Oh, I got those in the wrong order," meaning that the pragmatists and the White House staff were his biggest opponents. It was in this context that Dolan did a draft. Dolan says he did this draft primarily by researching other things that Reagan had said, which from my research I think is correct. It was at that point that the key moment in the drafting process occurred. President Reagan was given a copy of Dolan's draft and marked it up. I have a photocopy of that draft with me today. You cannot look at this for more than 90 seconds and believe that President Reagan was a mere actor. This was the key moment. A number of other, it goes, it goes on farther in the book, I have tried with my co-author John Jones to trace where every paragraph came from and mostly we have succeeded. But I can tell you some overarching things about the drafting. About 15, 16% came from the first draft, the bureaucratic draft. About 9% came from the first Dolan draft, almost without edits. 40, almost 50%, 46% was Dolan's draft as edited by President Reagan. 15%, 14.3% actually, was in Reagan's hand. And once Reagan wrote it, it pretty much was what was said. 
This means that Reagan either edited, sometimes quite heavily, or wrote roughly 60% of the address. What does looking at those edits tell you? The first thing it does is tell you that anything that Reagan was quite skillful in cutting out unnecessary material. He cut out a number of things in the Dolan draft that made the speech read better. Second, he was a good stylist. There are many, many edits where he, he cuts out three words and makes the sentence stronger, or he cuts out one paragraph, draws a line, and links two paragraphs together and makes them read better. But he was more than a stylist. That he was also, he, in his edits, he also often, he would both sharpen and sometimes or soften the ideological focus. Oftening, softening the ideological focus by rather than saying that our opponents were the Soviets, he would say, he did say in one case, the opponent was totalitarianism. A an edit that made it less confrontational but more ideological at the same time. And he also added several passages. For example, Reagan adds in his own hand the reference to the Soviets ending up on the ash heap of history, a reversal of what Trotsky had said. And Reagan also then adds several edits making clear his commitment to peace. You cannot look at this material and come to anything else except that Reagan was a gifted writer, and an even better editor, and at least on Soviet policy in particular, quite involved in the details of the arguments going on in the administration. The idea that he was a mere actor is ludicrous, in my view. I now turn to the to trip to Europe and the speech itself. The trip began with the G7 summit, which went so-so at best. Reagan then went on to Rome where he had substantive meetings with the Pope, substantive meetings about the best way to fight against the Soviets, especially in Poland. The substance was overwhelmed, however, when there were photographs showing President Reagan appear to nod off. It was, and he then went to Great Britain where there were massive demonstrations, 100,000 people demonstrated in Hyde Park, and uh, columnists continued to, to portray him as dangerous, in some cases drawing on the fact that he'd once been a movie actor. One British commentator labeled Reagan and Thatcher as the Lone Ranger and the Iron Lady. Another columnist said, referred to him as Old Hopalong and said he needed to do some fast fence mending. A former labor cabinet member said that Reagan will go down in history as the man who has done more damage to American security than any other president in alienating opinion in Western Europe among its people. As you can see, Reagan faced a daunting situation when he strode to the stage. And by the way, when he, well, the, the dais, when he went into the Royal Hall, only about one-third of the members of parliament or the House of Lords were there. Only 30 of 237 labor MPs even came, which I think gives you a sense of the anger level in Great Britain at that time. 